Hi everyone, Andy here at Bloomer Boomer. Now we all have our own age milestones in life. I think it has a lot to do with what's, what was, uh, what's going on in our life at a time that we reach, let's say 50, 60, or 80. But when we really start hitting 50 plus, at least in my experience, uh, more options are presented as we see our kids uh, leaving the nest, we see friends and loved ones falling ill or dying. Uh, there are retirement options looming relationships changing, it all hits us at different points. So I, I wanted to talk to someone who has uh, put her thoughts about what it's been like for her to, to hit the half century mark. In fact, the subtitle of her book is 50 After 50 is Reframing the Next Chapter of Your Life. So in a moment, we are going to talk with our author, Maria Leonard Olson. First, though, let's just get a plug in for Bloomer Boomer. It's all about uh, making the second act of life the best of all. Check us out, and we'll be right back with Maria Leonard Olson right after this. Well, our guest is Maria Leonard Olson, author of 50 After 50, Reframing the Next Chapter of Your Life. Maria, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, I've been going through your book, and the one thing that uh, jumped out at me is that in certain ways you are uh, atypical in certain ways, but uh, more conventional in other aspects. I'm not sure if you see it that way uh, or not. I do. I do. <laughs> okay, I good. The well, but... definitely translate into a lot of different situations, but yes, I understand that much of my story is not that ordinary. <laughs> it's it's not but uh, the the let's let's talk about first what i viewed as the more uh typical if you will you uh you uh wanted to work towards having uh kind of a a, a traditional uh life with your children as a as, am i right to say a stay at home mom or something that's like correct that? yes yeah and then uh, maybe t take it off from that point because i found that interesting the the two uh uh kind of opposites there. Yes, well, my mother was a working mom and my parents divorced when I was six years old. I was a latchkey kid and I did not like it. So I vowed to myself that if I were ever blessed with children that I would be a stay-at-home mom and had this very June Cleaver-esque view of what my childhood should have looked like. So I turned my perfectionism from my legal career to being the best mom that I could be, uh, almost in a way that wasn't healthy for me because I didn't allow myself to relax. I was reading constantly parenting books or talking to experts about what I should do next and how do I best support my children. And somewhere in the process, I lost myself actually well, so, you know that I, uh, the idea because I have a parent uh, w we uh, constantly were trying to get advice and uh, uh, were aware of, of the parenting books out there so from that standpoint I, I guess it's something that uh, a lot of parents uh, try to do they try to be the perfect parent Yes, I think that is a message that the media sends us, that if you do X, X, and X, your children will turn out to be wonderful kids and go to Harvard or whatever. But the reality is that there are so many forces that form a child. And while, yes, one must strive to be the best parent they can be, um, we cannot take 100% blame or credit for how our children turn out. They are humans. Yeah. Just like we are. I think that's so true. We uh, we as parents forget that. And the the other narrative that that I, I saw running through the book is encouraging people to uh, uh, what we call a bucket list, or I think that you call more of an action list. Uh, yeah. What do you see as important in that kind of a list? Well, for me, at age forty nine, I was pretty rudderless. I became an empty nester. I got divorced, and I got sober all in my 49th year. Whoa, that's a big year for you. So, yes. So I wanted to find some kind of structure for the next year in my life. And I began that by brainstorming things that I always wanted to do, places I wanted to go, things that I didn't like about my life that I wanted to improve upon. So 
I was with a therapist at one point in a rehab where I was being treated for alcoholism. And the therapist asked me, what makes you happy? And aside from my children, I didn't have an answer. And it bewildered me that I was a generally happy person before. I don't, I don't really know where my happiness took almost a non-existent backseat to the needs of my family and uh, pleasing others. So I brainstormed and came up with a list of things in several different areas, thrill-seeking, um, travel, lifestyle changes, because I had to live on my own for the first time in my entire life, um, spiritual changes. I, I knew that I needed a deeper spiritual life to stay sober and to be the best version of myself that I could be. So I made a lot of changes in my life, and I feel like I am moving towards being the best version of myself, only starting at age 50. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I've uh, written a book uh, that uh, it's really kind of about bucket lists, and, and what I learned while writing it is that what starts to become more important about bucket lists, as you start to see, are the personal relationships that you've had and, and you hope to have. And uh, do you see it that way? I do. Uh, in fact, I found it very instructive to read about Nurse Bronnie Ware's work. She chronicled uh, regrets of those on their deathbed. And she said the most common regrets were that didn't allow myself to be happier, that I spent too much time working, not enjoying life. I didn't nurture my close friendships and relationships with my family. So in the frenetic pace that we as Americans set, it's easy to get caught up in a routine. And sadly, it often takes a jarring event like a divorce or an illness to make us realize that Time is the most precious commodity that any of us has. We typically are very careful or at least mindful about how we spend our money in this country, but not that mindful about how we spend our time. And that changed for me as a result of my work on this book and a lot of inner exploration about what I really wanted in this part of my life because none of us knows how much time we have left. Yeah, well, it sounds like it was uh, certainly uh, an eye-opening uh, uh, experience in writing that book. And how would you hope that others could benefit from it? Well, I already am seeing the fruits of my labor. For me, the best and most gratifying part of being an author is connecting with readers. And this is a pretty personal book. I was a little anxious about how self-revelatory it was initially. But there are women, especially now, who come to me and say, I too survived sexual assault. You're so brave. Can I talk to you about this? Or people who are divorced who didn't see it coming and want to know, how do you get to the other side? Uh, I have connected with so many readers already, and the book just came out in June, who have said, carefully often, this is exactly what I need to reset my compass, because I feel a little bit lost right now. So that has been a wonderful thing. Yeah, resetting your compass, that's an interesting way to put it. You know, and since I've been uh, dealing in the space now, the, the digital space, uh, for about 10 years, uh, in this area, I'm still curious to understand people's drive or interest in approaching retirement with dreams of, of doing nothing uh, related to work and others who have a drive to stay busy and connected. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit early, but uh, what, what's your take on that? Well, I've realigned my priorities. and. I had a pretty high-charging legal career, but I have realized that for me, experiences are more important than things. I'm trying to practice um, minimalist mentality and 
shed belongings and instead spread spend as much of my resources on experiences, um, connecting with other people, getting to know this beautiful world that we live in. There's so much to see. So I don't envision myself um, relaxing in retirement entirely. I do have the practical approach that I would like to make enough money that I can travel because that is one of my greatest life joys is travel. So um, I do have an eye on being more deliberate about how I spend each day, especially in retirement. So I am not one of those who's going to play golf every day. It's just too much in this world that I want to know about. But if I stop but learning, I, hear, I feel like we start dying. I want to learn every day. But I also heard relaxing, didn't I? Yes, yes, relaxing, because I do tend sometimes to be more of a human doing than a human being, and I don't want to fall into the busyness trap again. I want to be more intentional and more present in my life and not just thinking, what's next, what's next? That was not... Um, gratifying way for me to live. Now you um, also speak about your biracial background. Can you share how that has impacted you now and moving forward? Yes, it really has. I was the only person of color in my predominantly white neighborhood uh, growing up. And my parents were forbidden by law to marry in the state of Maryland and 16 other states in the early 60s. And so that set a stage for me where I felt I needed to prove I was as good as all my white um, classmates. So I became a perfectionist and a people pleaser and was not proud of my dual heritage until decades, I was probably in my 20s when I started really wanting to know about my Filipino heritage. And I am grateful that my children are more interested than I was. Uh, my mom was an immigrant and very much wanted to assimilate into American society. Didn't teach me her language, which I think is a very unfortunate loss of the gift. And uh, I now celebrate my diversity. I speak at diversity conferences. I wrote a children's book because my children look white. People assumed that I was their brown nanny. So I wrote a children's book called Mommy, Why Is Your Skin So Brown? and used that as a vehicle to hopefully get people to not let their curiosity overwhelm their manners. And the questions people ask on the street, I'm frequently asked, so what are you? Um, human. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, for people who uh, want to learn more or, uh, about you or your book and so on, how, how can they do that? Well, my book is available at bookstores everywhere or Amazon. And my website is marialeonardwilson.com. I'm about to leave tomorrow on a 10-city book tour. So you can see where I'm going. And if you're listening and would like to say hello, I'd love to meet with you. Oh. So thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much. Our guest is uh, Maria Leonard Olson, author of 50 After 50, Reframing uh, the Next Chapter of Your Life. Maria, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Please like us on Facebook and visit us at BoomerBoomer.com. Until next time, so long.